Good afternoon. Welcome to day three of Fashion Forward and the D3 Fashion Talks. Setting up a fashion business has many complexities and the legalities of it, I think, are, are some of the biggest hurdles that young designers face. We're very honored to have with us today partners from the law firm of Baker and McKenzie here in Dubai, Jay Shri Gupta and Zahid Yunus, who are gonna take us through and have a, a bit of a presentation and then more of a question and answer session so we can keep it interactive as well on how to set up your business in the UAE. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here, and I'd like to thank D3 and Fashion Forward for having boring lawyers like us attend a, you know, a very, very trendy, trendy fashion week here at D3. Um, thank you for coming. Just to get a little bit of flavor um, around what we're going to talk about, because we're going to take you through several topics on, um, you know, uh, for the fashion industry and where law connects with the fashion industry. It would be really nice to know how many of you are designers here, how many of you are stylists here. So could you put up your hands? How many of you are stylists? Bloggers? Designers? Oh, that's quite a few. And the rest of you? <laughs> Any lawyers here? <laughs> ah, I see, we have a few here as well. So we'd love your input as we go along. Um, to start, I'd like to introduce Zahi and myself, who we are. Um, both of us have been practicing in the region for about 20 years, so it's fair to say that um, we um, are very familiar with the way the laws work in the GCC and the UAE. Today's topic is very much about building your brand in the UAE, so please feel free to stop us at any point and ask us questions. Um, my background is very much, uh, you know, it's working with fashion retailers, uh, couture houses, uh, doing distribution, retail, franchising, um, and various aspects of intellectual property protection, uh, which is obviously a cornerstone of the fashion industry. Um, Zahi speaks three languages. Um, uh, he's been here for the last 18 years and with Baker McKenzie for the last 10 years. And between us, I think it's fair to say that we do a significant amount of work with uh, what we call our global luxury um, retail and fashion team, uh, which is actually based in over 77 um, offices around the world for Baker McKenzie. So without much fuss, I'll go into uh, you know, the various aspects we're gonna touch upon today. We, we thought what we would do is we would talk to you for about 45 minutes, and of course, feel free to pitch in and raise your hand if you have any questions. And then 15 minutes could be sort of a bit interactive. Perhaps some of the things you've heard from other people who've talked to you over the last two days, or issues you faced, or perhaps different models in the fashion industry where, which you'd wanna talk about, and see where, again, law connects with some of those. So here on, here on this slide, what we've done is we've put up um, various aspects of, of consumption of luxury products and various aspects that luxury, uh, the luxury industry faces. I don't know if you've been reading the press lately, but I think the luxury market in the GCC is estimated to have been something like $53 billion in 2013. And amazingly, 23 billion of that was just the UAE. So what I would say to you is you're probably in the right place at the right time to grow your fashion business. And I think notwithstanding crisis, everybody looks to the fashion industry to feel happier and you know, feel that confidence, especially when markets are down. So uh, you know, there, there's, there's, I always think if you can't stop thinking about something, buy it. And that for me sums up the fashion industry. So now there are various aspects of doing business here and doing business in retail and luxury that you need to think about. So many of you who are designers here today might be thinking about how do I actually set up something? Obviously, we're very lucky here to have Dubai Design District, which was the vision of um, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed to lead the country into the period of innovation. So to build fashion brands from this region and from the UAE. You've got that forum to set up a presence, and I'll talk you through some of the ways you can set it up. But you have to remember that under Dubai, there is a law that says that if you are practicing business here in Dubai, you must have a license. So you must have a trading presence. And again, if you're a freelancer or you're working on your own, there are ways in which to do that through the licensing regime in D3. So that's the fundamental principle. The other fundamental principle is that if you are doing business onshore in Dubai, you need to have a 51% UAE national partner. So whilst the rules have been liberalized on, in many spheres, if you're doing distribution, you're selling your products in the market here, you're, you're 
setting up a store in the mall, you will probably need to have a, a local limited liability company that requires you to have a local partner, either UAE national or a UAE national company. So as a foreign partner, you can own 49% uh, of it and the local would own 51. So those are the two sort of main premises of doing business that I, you, you need to remember. The other thing is distribution. Um, Zahi will talk about that. He will give you a flavor of joint ventures and distribution because what may happen is you may need to showcase your designs or uh, you know, your, your wares, so to speak, in a, a particular store, in a particular multi-branded store or through a distributor because you may not have the means to set up uh, uh, you know, 10 stores around the UAE and you may need to partner with somebody or you may need to appoint someone who understands the distribution network. So we'll talk about that a little bit. There's real estate issues as well. Obviously, you know, fashion, notwithstanding where e-commerce and uh, you know, retailing online is going, is a very bricks and mortar business. People like to feel the fabric. People like to try on clothes. No matter what you say and how much online shopping is you know, coming, coming up and doing well, people do like to be in a store and feel the brand or feel, feel the presence. You've got the regulatory issues. You've obviously got employment issues because you, you, you're going to have to have employees in your business, right? You, you, if you're the creative mind, you're going to have to have somebody doing the finance. You're going to have somebody else having to do uh, you know, the, the administration, et cetera. So uh, you know, we often find, that's why a, a lot of my very creative clients and me sometimes have a complete disconnect because they live in a different world and I'm telling them, no, you need, need to think about this, you need to think about that. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't need to think about anything. We need to think about our designs working and our designs being you know, the epitome of, of, of the new age. So there's always that, that, that sort of difficult matrix between being creative, but remembering that if you want to do business, you need to sell your designs, you need to have a framework within which you need to do that. Intellectual property. I guess that's one of the issues we're going to talk about and, and, and give you some examples. But IP enforcement, protection, registering your brand, registering your trademark, protecting your design is a very, very important part of the design and fashion industry. Um, E-commerce, social media, and data privacy. Um, data privacy laws are coming in. Uh, E-commerce does have a set of regulations. So don't think just because you're online, you're not subject to the laws of the UAE, you would be. Um, dispute resolution, obviously if you decide to enter into a joint venture or distribution, you might get into a dispute. And you need to know where you stand, what your rights are, and how you're going to protect yourself. Competition, not so much yet of an issue here, but will be. And then tax, transfer pricing, and customs. Obviously, customs is an issue here, but effectively, you need to be aware that whilst we live in a no corporate tax zone and, and um, D3 and TCOM and all the other free zones uh, you know, give you tax holidays, you may be doing business in other GCC countries or selling your products in other GCC countries where you may be subject to tax. So always check that and, and know, and know, um, you know where you stand on that front as well. Right, um, moving on to establishing in D3, we've just got two slides here, and I mean, we're happy to email you these packs so you don't need to worry about the content too much. Um, really looking at, effectively, all the different types of categories and segments that you can set up in. Are many of you familiar with this? Have you seen this? Yeah, you've had a look at this, yeah? So you've got marketing, you've got fashion, you've got luxury, you've got design, you've got e-commerce, you, and you've got other ancillary services, which are usually sort of the restaurants, cafes, law firms, if they decide to, to, to set up as well, and interior design as well. So uh, D3 does allow you to have a number of different categories, and it allows you to also do more than one thing. So as long as those categories, those activities are related to one another, then you could do more than one thing having your office or presence here. Um, there's share capital requirements. So if you're setting up a company, then obviously you need to know how much share capital you're going to put into that company. So again, it's pretty important to manage your business and know how much money you need to put in. But once you put in that share capital, you can withdraw that share capital and use it for the business. So again, those are other categories that you could, you could find out about. Hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Zahi. Basically, I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, the way to do business uh, in the UAE or in the wider uh, region, GCC region. Uh, 
Uh, basically, I'm going to focus on two main models. One is called the distribution model, whereby the owner of a brand, the owner of a franchise, the owner of a concept would appoint a distributor, a franchisee or a commercial agent in Dubai or in the region to uh, develop the brand, to uh, do the distribution activities, to open and operate stores, boutiques, restaurants. Um, and so basically, I'm going to talk about commercial agency distribution and franchise. And the second model is setting up a direct presence. This is a situation where uh, the owner of the brand or the designer or the you know, fashion people decide to set up directly a presence uh, either in D3 or in another free zone in the UAE or onshore or even to expand to the entire region. Um, can I? First, the distribution model. I mean, this is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a situation where uh, the owner of the brand decide, I don't want to invest locally. I want to appoint a distributor who's going to take care of my business. And so basically, the first question that comes to mind is, who is going to be my distributor? Which distributor am I going to choose? And I think the response to this question depends on many factors. I mean, first of all, you need to know whether you want to be uh, present only in the UAE or maybe, you know, broaden your activity to the entire GCC or to the Middle East. It depends on the type of, uh, you know, brand. Uh, is it in the uh, retail fashion? It, it is a luxury brand. Is it a uh, restaurant? Is it in the media, sales, telecom? And so basically, depending on the type of activities that you want to conduct, you're going to have to go and select distributors who have experience and who have their track record in, in the region. Um, another topic that is uh, important is, and, and so many times clients ask us, what is, is it better to appoint uh, a distributor or a commercial agent or a franchisee on a, an exclusive basis or a non-exclusive basis. Obviously, I mean, if you look at it from the side of the uh, owner of the brand or the foreign supplier, the tendency would be to maybe start with a non-exclusive, uh, you know, appointing a non-exclusive distributor because by appointing a non-exclusive distributor, you're going to have less risk because if things go wrong with the distributor, then you're going to have the choice to appoint another distributor. I mean, from the distributor side, I think they, they will try to insist on having exclusivity because they don't want to be in a position where there is another distributor either in the UAE or in the region who is competing with them. And so basically, again, there is no right or wrong way, uh, you know, to do it. Uh, it really depends on, you know, a number of uh, facts. Our uh, recommendation is generally for foreign, uh, you know, owners of brands to try to uh, start with a non-exclusive arrangement for a short period of time. And then if things go well with the distributor, then move on to an exclusive Arrangement. I mean, obviously, this is not always, you know, possible to achieve. But, but again, that's something that we would generally recommend. Another important topic is registration, and that's something that always uh, comes um, into question. Basically, the question is: Shall we register the commercial agency agreement or the distribution agreement with the relevant authorities in the UAE or elsewhere in the region? And I think the response depends on whether we're advising the foreign supplier or the owner of the brand or we're advising the distributor or the commercial agent. And basically, if you register a, what you need to know is that if you register a commercial agency agreement, this is going to give a number of protections to the distributor. 
uh, he's gonna be able to say that basically I'm gonna be subject to the commercial agency regulations and the commercial agency regulations, they include a number of protections uh, to the distributor, which is kind of considered the weak party to the arrangement. And this means that if, if the foreign supplier wants to terminate a registered agreement, he's gonna, be, he's gonna have tough time doing it. The law is gonna protect the distributor. Uh, he's gonna give him the right to compensation in case of termination of the agreement, and sometimes not only for cause, but also for convenience. And also, even in case of non-renewal of a distribution agreement after the expiry of its term, the commercial agency law may give a certain compensation to the distributor. Another important topic is what to include in the distribution agreement. What we see very frequently is a foreign supplier coming with a standard distribution agreement or franchise agreement that he use everywhere in the world, including a number of, I don't know, terms and conditions, and he goes and signs it with a distributor without consulting uh, you know, with legal advisors. I think it is very important, obviously, to start with you know, a precedent, but I think it's very important to think about every single provision that is going to be included in the agreement between the owner of the brand, between the fashion designer and the distributor. Because this is a document that you're gonna rely on once things go bad. Uh, you're gonna go back to the agreement and say, what were the obligation of the foreign owner of the brand? What was or owner of the brand? What, what, what were the obligations of the distributor? And did I comply with these obligations or did my distributor comply with these obligations? And so I think for, for the owner of the brand, it's very important to make sure that your distributor is going to be you know, responsible for a certain uh, number of sales, target sales, uh, during the first year, second year, three years, or five years. It's important to make sure that uh, the distributor is going to stick to a certain business plan that you're gonna put you know, to him in the agreement. He's gonna open a number of stores or open a number of you know, outlets, employ a number of, 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 of employees, and meet the targets. On the other side, if you are the distributor, you wanna make sure that the owner of the brand is going to transfer the know-how properly, is going to train your employees, is going to provide you with all the support needed to develop the brand. Um, finally, one major thing that you have to always bear in mind when you enter into a relationship with a distributor, w what are the termination events? I mean, it's, it's hard sometimes to think about the termination of the relationship when you're starting a relationship, but that's something that is so key and you need to think about it from the beginning because the last thing that you want is to be stuck for a period of time in the UAE or elsewhere in the region in a relationship where things go wrong because that's gonna affect significantly, significantly not only the brand and the operations but also the reputation that you have uh, in, in, the, in the market. Can I move to the second one? Uh, and one more, please. I think the second, the second one that I'm gonna talk about is the second model of doing business is the direct presence. This is a situation where the foreign, invest, the foreign owner of the brand or the fashion designer decide I'm gonna set up a presence directly in D3, in another free zone or in the UAE or even outside the UAE in the GCC region. I don't wanna rely on a distributor because I want to have control over my brand. I want to have control over the operations. And it may well be that you'll be able to set up the presence alone without the need of a local distributor, especially if you set up a presence in a free zone where there is no um, foreign ownership restrictions. However, as Jeshri mentioned at the beginning, if you're gonna set up a presence onshore, 
If you want to open a store or open an outlet or open a restaurant or open any business in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi outside the free zones or in other GCC jurisdiction like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, you're gonna have to hook up with a local partner. And generally, in the entire region, there is a requirement that, especially in the trading activities, that you're gonna have to have a 49% uh, local uh, owner. Um, I mean, there are some exceptions that varies from a, from a country to a country, obviously. Um, it is important to know where to set up your business. As I mentioned, if you're a you know, designer or a you know, fashion uh, person and you want to open your own office, I mean, you can set it up in D3. I mean, obviously D3 is, you know, this is where all the brands, all the fashion designers are going to be. I mean, this is where the network is. But this does not mean that you will be able to work outside the D3. I mean, obviously you can work for clients outside the D3 by either meeting with them or them coming and meeting with you. But if you want to open a store or an outlet outside the D3, then you would need to, uh, to set up an onshore a limited liability company in partnership with a uh, local uh, shareholder. Now, what will be the, the objectives? I mean, the second point that is very important, why am I setting up this company? And when, when, when you want to respond to this question, you shouldn't think only today or on a short-term period. You need to look at it from a mid to long-term period. And what are my expansion plan? Am I only planning to uh, set up a company to support uh, local distributor? Am I, am, am I going to only conduct marketing activities or am I planning to do directly sales? Am I planning to set up a vehicle that is going to be the regional this hub or the logistic hub for the region? And so basically the response to this question is going to drive the legal form or the, the type of entity that you're gonna set up the free zone where you're gonna set up the entity or even the jurisdiction. I mean, you may well have to set up a number of entities to deal with all these objectives. I mean, we have seen clients setting up an entity in D3 to support their sales activities in the region, an entity in, Dubai, in, in, in Jabal Ali, you know, to take care of the logistics, an entity onshore in Dubai, you know, to open a retail store and other branches or entity in the entire GCC region to also conduct the type of activities that they want. Um, obviously, for each activity, you're gonna have to get a license and so it's very important to, when you want to set up a presence, to look at the licenses that are available in the free zone and uh, the good thing about D3 is that it has a very wide range of licenses you know, varying from, you know, marketing, uh, support, design, to uh, supply, uh, importation, exportation, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and retail. Um, shall I move to the second one? Now, again, if you have to set up an entity with a local shareholder, I mean, whether in the free zone or outside the free zone, the key thing is, to think about is what will be the ownership of the local distributor and what will be my ownership? I mean, that's a key question because it's gonna, it's gonna be very important a few years down the road when the business grows in the region and where there will be value in the company. Now, that is going to depend very much on the contribution of the foreign owner and the contribution of the local owner. The foreign owner is gonna bring his know-how, his concept. He's gonna bring sometimes the investment. The local owner is gonna bring more the local know-how, you know, the connections with the local market. And, and, and basically, you're gonna end up in a situation where you own either a minority stake or a majority stake or a 
JV where you're in a 50-50 ownership position. And that's gonna affect you know, the majority, the way uh, you're gonna impose the operations in the company. I mean, one thing to bear in mind is even if you come as a uh, minority shareholder and you are gonna have to come as a 49% shareholder if you open up an office or a company in the UAE onshore, you can have a disproportionate allocation of profits where even though you own 49% of the shares, you're gonna be entitled up to 80% and 90% and maybe even more of the profits. And so that's a very, you know, um, a good example uh, or a good flexibility in the UAE that allows you to hook up with a local partner without worrying about the allocation of profits. Another important thing to bear in mind is the management of the company. Who is going to be responsible for the management of the company? Um, the UAE gives you the flexibility, even if you are a minority shareholder, to have control over the management of the company. And when I say control over the management of the company, this means that you're gonna be in a position where you could include in the incorporation documents of the company the right for the minority shareholder or the foreign shareholder to appoint the board members or the majority of the board and to appoint the general manager who's gonna be responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company. And that's something that is very important because it all boils down to who's gonna be running the show. I may well be a minority stakeholder because I don't have the investment needed, but I need to have control over the operation. I need to be the one who's gonna appoint the board, who's gonna set the strategy going forward, who's gonna appoint the general manager, who's gonna be responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company. I only need the local shareholder or the foreign shareholder for the capital has, that he's gonna inject. Finally, uh, exit options. That's again something that is very important to bear in mind at the very beginning of the arrangement that you're entering into. You need to think about what if things go wrong. Again, as I mentioned in the distribution model, you don't wanna be in a position where you hook up with a local partner and you get stuck forever. Things go wrong, you cannot terminate the agreement, you cannot sell his shares, you cannot buy his shares. You need to put the mechanism in the contract in place that allows you to deregister the agreement if things go wrong, to terminate the agreement if things go wrong, and to have the put and call options or the right to purchase the shares of the local shareholder for a certain value or to, to sell you his, your share if you wanna exit from the company. I'm gonna hand off to you, Ria. Thank you. Thanks, Zahi. Um, we're gonna move to a different, slightly different topic, but that also relates to some of the things Zahi talked about, like joint ventures and distribution agreements and what you put in them. So let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. When you think of Hermes, and you think of an Hermes Birkin or Kelly, or you think of Versace, and you think of the Medusa motive, everyone familiar with the Medusa motive in Versace? When you think of a Vera Wang wedding dress, or you look around you and you see some people wearing Doc Martens, and you immediately know that Doc Martens is a type of shoe and it's a type of boot and this is what it looks like. So think about what Chanel said. She said that in order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. And all of these things that I talked about, Vera Wang, Versace, Hermes, they're different and they're distinguishable from everything else you've seen. They've created an identity and a brand that's identified with a certain level of luxury and a certain level of, you know, a fashion brand. So here are all of these products that applied intellectual creativity and also skill in the fashion industry, but they needed to protect themselves from other people copying them. So you've got, you've got two scenarios here. You've got counterfeits, which would, for example, a Versace counterfeit would use the Medusa motive, but it would be a counterfeit. And then you've got other things like copycats, where effectively they don't use the logo, but they look like or they are confusingly similar to an Hermes, Kelly, or Birkin. 
Now, what I've put up here on the slide is a couple of things you need to think about. There are many, many different aspects to intellectual property in what you guys are creating. Whether you're a blogger, a stylist, or you know, a designer, there are certain aspects of your work which create a specific type of intellectual property. Now, that can be a trademark, it can be a copyright, or it can also be a patent or a design, an industrial design. Um, many of you must source your textile fabric from different places. Many of you may also be designing a textile fabric or a specific motif, um, like we saw digital prints, how it went crazy. Everybody in the world was looking at digital prints, and then there were all these knockoffs and copycats in the market on digital prints. So nobody doubts the importance of um, intellectual property in the fashion industry. Whether it's high fashion or ready to wear, you're always going to have any of most of these issues. Yet you'll be amazed at how many people in the fashion industry pay very little attention to and spend very little money on protecting something they've created. So really, it's your bread and butter. That's your business. And you're spending the least amount of money protecting that. And it does cost money. Because if you want to register a trademark, and many people come to me and say, well, I'm the McDonald's of the fashion industry. OK, bad example, but you get what I'm saying. And we, you know, we, we are so famous that we don't need to protect ourselves. Wrong. You do. Trademarks have to be registered. It's very territorial in nature. So you need to register a trademark in every country you're selling your designs in, or you're selling your product in, and where you've created your brand. Every country has a different regime for registration of trademark. And whilst the UAE is a signatory to pretty much every international convention on protection of intellectual property, whether it's the WTO, the Berne Convention, the Paris Convention, um, you know, uh, the GATT, the TRIPS Agreement, all of that, yes. But you still need to protect yourself locally. Because if you have somebody copying your name or your trademark and using that as some sort of hybrid in their design or using that as a trade name to set up their company, so you know, we, we've had examples where a client who was you know, a big fashion house, so we had one recently from Italy, who basically uh, had given away some distribution rights some 25, 30 years ago. And this gentleman, who was the distributor locally, was using the Italian fashion brand in, his, in, in the name of his company. So it was really, really difficult for us to bring back the brand and take back the brand. And the other thing you need to realize as well is that there are limitations to how much the law can help you unless you've taken all the steps to register. So for example, again, whilst copyright traditionally doesn't need to be registered to be protected, often if you are, you are coming up with something very specific or something that is very um, uh, different, we, uh, we, re we advise you to register it. I'll give you another example. There's a very famous artist here in the UAE who developed this very particular, very beautiful camel that was charming to children as well as to adults. And this camel started appearing on co the cover of some very uh, you know, um, widely circulated magazines and publications. And then the camel and, and the design was being copied. So we went to the ministry and we went to um, you know, the regulators and we said, look, this, this camel is very distinctive to our client and th these are her designs and she's been doing this for the last 10 years. She developed this camel. And the ministry said, oh, no, no, but when we look at the cover of this magazine you're showing us, there are at least five differences. The pink is not exactly light pink and the eye of the camel is slightly smaller, but come on, it was confusingly similar enough for any of you to look at that cover and say, this is the camel of that lady. So things like that, where the ministry wasn't that sympathetic because our client hadn't registered her design, her copyright, even though she didn't have to do that under the law. So you need to sometimes remember the law tells you one thing, but practice tells you, you know, this is how you should be doing it because this is how the enforcement agencies and the government would look at it. So obviously there's branding and there's trademarks. There's design, which is at the heart of every, every um, fashion um, item, whether it's fresh, new, original. And then there's obviously protection by copyright. So things like you've developed in terms of your writing or things of the, the stylization of your website on e-commerce, things like that. You need to have good terms of con conditions of use. How many of you use um, Apple phones here, for example? And you get updates, right? Every five minutes, there's an, a new iOS update. And then it asks you to click on the terms of use. It says agree or disagree. If you disagree, it sends it to you by email and it doesn't upload that iOS. Everyone familiar with it? All of you have clicked the agree button. Have any of you read the terms and conditions of use? 
Exactly. So there you go. So there's a lot of stuff in there that would protect Apple uh, in relation to your use of their software and, and, and that upgrade. So things like that you need to remember. Are any of you here e-commerce retailers or intend to sell your designs on, yeah, so a number of you. So there are many IP issues surrounding that and you need to be aware of that. So the first, the first battle is being aware of it and then acknowledging what you need to protect. Clearly, you don't need to protect everything, and you won't be able to protect everything. But spend your money wisely. Do an audit on what you own and what brand you have. And there are different concepts. So for example, net porter when it came up and everyone said, who's going to buy luxury on, on online, right? And then everybody did. And then there's another company like Zara, for example. So Zara knows that well, the concept of Zara is really keeping up with the trends, but delivering the trend to you literally within one week of the trend being out in any, you know, on a famous actress or an, an actor or in a magazine or, you know, the general trend of what's going on. And why is that? Because Zara's business model is very different. They don't wait for the knockoffs, the copycat market. They deliver to you. They literally have a design model where other, other designers would take three to four months to get to that level and to be able to provide you with uh, you know, designs from that trend, whereas Zara can do it end to end in a week. And the delivery model is 48 hours to their stores. So that's an amazing model where there is no time to copy because before you can copy, the trend has changed. But not everybody has that, that kind of uh, you know, um, resource as a company like Zara do, but that, that, that's why they created this, this very different model. And remember your trade secrets as well. So many of you may be sourcing things from suppliers, from designers, from factories, from manufacturers. These are all your trade secrets, where you get things from. So don't share that information loosely. Don't give away that information to your distributors without signing non-disclosure agreements, without making sure it's kept confidential. Th those are all you know, pretty, pretty important thing. Um, lastly, I would say to you that all of the intellectual property regime in the UAE is not implemented uniformly um, and very differently. So always check where you stand. Um, I've, I've given you some examples. We, we also had another case where um, one of my clients uh, had the name The One. You all know the furniture store, The One, and, and he loves talking about it. He's sort of a gregarious uh, you know, owner of the business. And um, of course, when you translate the one into Arabic, it translates into al wahad or al awal, and that really means Allah or God. So try to go to the trademark registration departments in the GCC countries, in the Arabic-speaking countries, and try to register God as a trademark. That's a little bit difficult. So you might find unforeseen aspects of your business where you need to think about, so ultimately, we, of course, we did a transliteration of the name, and that's what's registered, because he wasn't going to be able to get away with registering uh, you know, Allah as, a, as his, his own brand. But that's the kind of thing you need to think about is what's unique about my business, where do I stand, what do I want to protect, and what is going to be irreplaceable in, in, terms, of, in terms of that design. So that's, that's your sort of first step to creating some very iconic, um, very iconic designs. Um, we won't go into this in too much detail, but real estate, we talked about bricks and mortar business. And um, as Zahi said, if you decide to have a store, if you decide to go to Dubai Mall, which is right down the road, or you go to Mall of the Emirates, or uh, many of the new malls, I, I, I re I'm writing an article next week for the Gulf News on the retail trade and trends. And I was shocked to see how many new malls and how many millions of square feet are actually being coming up in the next year in the UAE. You would be amazed. So you're going to have to deal with these real estate issues. So remember, when you're negotiating your real estate agreements, when you're setting up a store, or if you're taking part of a store um, you know, of, of, a, of another, uh, of another um, distributor, then you need to make sure uh, many of these things, like rent review, um, you know, your ability to, to let, th to use that space for something other than your design. If so, if you need 100 square feet today, but you need 50 square feet tomorrow. You need to have flexibility with that space. Uh, and again, things like you know relocation. So many of the malls, you might end up in a situation where you are given one spot on one particular, in one particular year. But then, if if you're doing very well or you're not doing as well, um, the mall may ask you to move from that particular place. So be aware that the the mall contracts and the leasing contracts are quite complex. And there, there are lots of little, you know, 
things in there, tricks in there that, that mall owners would maybe use. Um, and you need to be aware of that and you need to read those contracts. So notwithstanding you're not reading your Apple terms of use, you need to read those <laughs> lease agreements when you get them. And then lastly, we're just gonna touch very briefly on this. Hopefully none of you ever gets into a fight with anybody, um, but it does happen. So if you're going to be adventurous and enter into joint ventures, if you're gonna have distribution agreements, you're going to have you know, landlords, you're probably going to end up in a situation where you may have to agree that you have a dispute and you have to deal with it. One of the toughest things to do in a business, but you need to protect your investment from the very beginning. So the easiest thing to do is have a really great contract which has a really good, robust arbitration or dispute resolution clauses in it, then put it in the drawer and get on with your business and hope that you never have to look at them again. But you need to know that sometimes, or you need to know what, what, what is available to you. So here in the UAE, you have many different levels of courts. In fact, in the UAE, you'd be pretty amazed to know that there are three court systems in one country. So you've got, you've got the Dubai court system, which has its own um, court of cassation or Supreme Court, and then you've got the federal court system, which also has its own Supreme Court, and both of them are you know, dif dif different court systems. And then you have the DIFC, which is the Dubai International Financial Center, which many of you may he have heard of, which also has arbitration as well as it has um, dispute resolution. It has its own courts, which are more common law style, whereas the rest of the UAE is more civil law style. So different types of rules, different types of discovery, different types of process apply, apply to these things. So whenever you're signing up to anything, remember, do I wanna go into arbitration? Is arbitration going to be more expensive or less expensive than going to a court? Perhaps you wanna get a mediator. So you wanna get somebody like uh, you know, the chairman of a law firm or a chairman of an accountancy firm or somebody in there to have a sensible conversation with whoever you're having a dispute with before you go into a court a battle or you go into a mediation. And then obviously, you know, things like commercial distribution. Zahi talked about the fact that you might have to have a registered commercial agent or an unregistered commercial agent. If you have a registered commercial agent, then that's a, a very different type of battle to get out of that relationship. And you may have to go to the courts for that. So hopefully, I think, I think we're at the end of, um, end of um, all the knowledge we were going to impart to you, but hopefully, you, you know, we, we, we'd love for you to raise some questions. Perhaps you're facing certain challenges in your business at the moment, or perhaps there are aspects of our presentation which struck you more than others, and we'd be happy to take questions and, and talk about these. So over to you guys. Any questions? I think some people might be a bit shy to ask in this environment <laughs> as well. And if we can ask you, if you're able, um, Jayshree and Zahi, to stay maybe for 10, 15 minutes afterwards, we can invite everyone to the forward lounge right in front of here and they can interact with you one yeah, on one. Yeah, sure, we'd be very happy works. to. Thank yeah. you, Ritu, thanks. Thank you thanks. so much for a very informative presentation. I know everyone's walking away with a lot of critical information to setting mm -hmm. up their businesses. Now Thank you, you all for being here. <laughs> now everybody can leave the lawyers and get back to the fun stuff Not that's happening it was, outside. It was <laughs> fascinating. And for those of you who do want to stay and speak to Jayshree and Zahi a little bit longer, we just ask that you move um, out just to the courtyard in front of uh, uh, the hall. And there's a show at 2.30 in Hall 2, D by Dahlia. Thank you.